Hey everyone, this is part two of our discussion with Robert Pondicio. It picks up right where we left off in part one. Welcome back. Robert Pondicio, welcome back uh, to this discussion uh, about how the other half learns. Uh, your new book about Success Academy schools after you spent a year there. Um, I found it a little funny, but also illuminating the title of this piece that you wrote uh, <laughs> yeah. introducing the book. Uh, and I'll read it. The title was, I just wrote a book about Success Academy charter schools. It does not support your preferred narrative. I hope you hate it. Um, yeah. First Great of all, in marketing. get a different uh, marketing advisor. That's the first thing. <laughs> Second of all, uh, what do you mean? I hope you hate it. Well, I, I, I mean, I meant it puckishly but earnestly. Right. In other words, uh, the intent of, of that piece, the intent of this book, really, is to kind of question people's priors. I mean, look, you know, I, my ed reform credentials are in good order. I'm, I'm a choice guy. I'm a charter guy. I teach part time right now at a charter school. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, drinking too deeply of the ideology, so right. to speak, uh, or the political narratives, I guess, more, more accurately, sure. uh, that, that we have thrown about uh, in, in reform and charter world for you know, the last 20 years. You know, there are these dueling narratives um, you know, at the risk of oversimplifying. You know, the, 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 the pro-charter narrative goes, um, you know, kid goes in this door, they get a good outcome, they go in that door, bad outcome, the only difference is, is, is the school. Um, if you are anti-charters, well then it's, you know, you gotta fix, uh, you know, um, poverty, racism, et cetera, fix those things and schools will be better. Well, you know, th there's, a, there's a, a lot of daylight in between those two, um, but for various political reasons, we, we tend to be loyal to one of those narratives or, or, or the other. Neither one, I think, ha has served us very, very well. So when I say, here's my new book, I hope you'll hate it, it's interesting. Um, we talked in the first segment about this, this, this book and these schools being something of a Rorschach test. So you know, it, that's kind of what I expected, that regardless of where you are, pro-charter or anti-charter, pro-reform, anti-reform, you will see things in this book that will confirm your priors. My hope was that you would also see things that would, would challenge those priors. Sure. Um, I should probably write another piece at this point because so, uh, the book has been well received, which I'm pleased by, but, but it's not necessarily a good thing because that means you're only looking at the things that you want. I should probably probably write another book that says yeah, you like my book and, and I'm disappointed. Yeah, well, let's let's bring up some of these different perspectives right. on this and I'll reserve the right to advocate for the devil. If it okay, helps, please. Uh, uh, to, to make the conversation. One, one of the things that often gets lobbed at Success Academy is, uh, yeah, it does great because it's, uh, it's creaming. It's yeah. creaming, it's taking the best kids and if we could take the best kids, sure. we'd have those scores too. Um, you say that that's not quite right. It's not and quite that wrong. It's not quite wrong. Yeah. What, so is, what is the Stephen, lay this out for What me. is the Stephen Colbert phrase? It's truthy. Yeah, so I guess it's right. truthy. Um, I, I think I'd end up describing this. And I think this is an accurate way to describe what success does. It's, it's a bit of a self-selection engine. So there is there is creaming going on, um, but it's the parents who are self-selecting. Uh, it, it's worth discussing just briefly the way this works. I mean, there, there is this impression, and this is another part of the standard charter narrative, Absolutely. that because there is a um, the existence of a lottery for oversubscribed charter schools, that therefore, by definition, you're getting a, um, a random assortment of, of, of kids. And that's true enough. Um, but what happens at success, and this has been hiding in plain sight for, for years, uh, they, you, win a, you win a seat in the lottery, then you're invited to a welcome meeting. Right. And even if you're on uh, the, the, the waiting list, what they call the likely list, remember that term, it's significant, if you're on the likely list, you still have to come to the meeting. Uh, at which point the, the, the school lays out in, in unsparing terms their expectations and their culture, and they ask you repeatedly, you have to ask yourself, mom and dad, is Success Academy right for you? Right. Not is it right for your kid, is it right for you? That's not an accident. Um, because a lot of parents decide, well, it's not right for me. I, this, this culture is too much. The expectations are too much. And, and then there's structural things as well. If you can't uh, bring your kid to school at 7.30 in the morning, pick them up 3.45 in the afternoon, half days on Wednesday, half days on Wednesday no transportation, it, yeah. no after school, then it's literally not for you. Right. Um, in other, whether it's uh, uh, by, by design or by happenstance, 
it it favors families that have uh, parental bandwidth, if you like. Yep. Uh, so so the, while I don't have data on this, this is I want to be clear on this. I'm not a researcher. This my approach here is journalistic. Sure. But observably, you see families at Success Academy who tend to be married, religious, engaged, um, uh, motivated. Right. And and to be quite frank, when teachers are looking for parents to support the instruction that's going on in their classroom. Yeah. These are the parents they want. Right? Well, that's exactly right. But I don't want to leave the impression that this is every parent. Sure. I mean, you're still talking about families living in poverty in places like the South Bronx. So nobody should kid themselves and say this is this is easy. It should be established that success as students are genuinely disadvantaged. Low they income, low income, almost exclusively low income families of color. Right. Yes. But they are not necessarily... Uh, the same as the families that I was teaching at, at PS 277 a few blocks away right. uh, some, some years ago. I, I, I'm trying not to parse this to make, make too much of this, but I think when we look at the differences um, demographically, we're missing something. To, to use a term from marketing, you almost have to look at it psychographically. You know, the, the, the family that is, uh, the, I would argue that the family that uh, raises their hand and says, oh, I want a charter school is immediately different than the family that does not say that. And then the family that says, no, I want Success Academy Charter School uh, is different than the other two. Yeah, and there's, there are just a lot, a, a, a lot of hoops that they have to press through. So right. my question but on that, this... That drives the culture. In other words, you can't do these things. You can't have this just-so culture, these high expectations, unless you have maybe not every family, but a critical mass of family voting with their feet repeatedly who become functionally the culture keepers. Right. So, you know, my question then, and you said you're not a researcher, you don't have the numbers on this, and I don't want numbers, I want a gut sense. Yeah. How potent is this mechanism whereby some parents leave because they're, they're not going to toe the line. It's, yeah. it's too much. And it is too much, right? Black socks are not okay. <laughs> Only blue socks are okay. Right. They'll turn kids away at the door, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you don't come to the orientation meeting, we give your seat to someone else, right? These are, these are pretty potent yeah. roadblocks for some parents. Uh, so I'm just wondering, how far does it go? Well, I'm not sure. Well, say more. When you say how far well, I mean, does it go? How potent is this as a tool for creating a... Uh, a cadre of parents that is distinct yeah. from your run-of-the-mill cross-section of yeah. parents. Look, I think Eva Moskowitz might give you a different answer. Um, you know, uh, and I think for what for what it's worth, I, I think that they don't like the impression. And I want to be clear: I'm not trying to create the impression right. that this is the secret sauce. This is the starting line. Um, but it's look, it's just a lot easier. I don't not easy, easier than that. Right to accomplish these things with, with families and students who are buying what you're selling, uh, as opposed to a coercive relationship where you're trying to get them in the game, which is sometimes how I felt as a, as a teacher in the DOE. I was trying to you know, get, get my kids to, 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 you know, to, to follow through and, and step up. There, that's, that's, that's a, a given, right. so to speak. And, and if it's not a given, then, you, then you're pushing it back to the parents and the parents make sure that you know, the, the, the kids are engaged and ready and whatnot. Sure. Um, so it's, you know, I, I wanna be, try to be precise here. That's not the secret sauce, uh, but it's, it, it enables this culture of high achievement and these results, and I think it contributes to the consistency. And look, this is, this is anybody who's watching this who, you know, my parents' generation who maybe went to Catholic schools in New York of the 40s or 50s say, well, duh, that's, right. that's the way this works. Yeah. You know, so it's, this, is, this is why I kept focusing on school culture. Because it's interesting, right? In other words, this is the one thing in the reform era that we're almost not allowed to touch. Why do we have these random lotteries? Well, because we're supposed to do this with every child. So, uh, you know, can you do this with every child or does it require families at some level who are, who are buying what you're selling? Yeah. I think that that's a big lesson there, of, of, of these schools. In the book, you have the, uh, the, the is it come to Jesus yeah. chapter, is yeah. that right? Yeah, and there's a, there's a description of uh, a teacher going after kindergarten parents, it's making certain, it clear that yeah. they are not doing their part of the bargain and that they need to step up. Yeah. That is the absolute message, and she's in it with them. So talk to me a little bit about this concept that's in the book a couple of times about this partnership or this marriage between the families that are there and the uh, school staff. Yeah, look, this this is where um, I think Moskowitz has been done considerable dirt by by um, uh, media coverage and whatnot. There, there's this impression out there that one, they're claiming 
uh, students and parents. And, and as I just was describing, I think there, there, there's self-selection there. And there's this impression that these are harsh militaristic places, almost like Chinese cram schools in a way. Um, to be perfectly honest, there's a lot of things that they do that as a, as a teacher, as, as an educator, I, I don't particularly love. I'm not crazy about sure. aggressive test prep. Um, while I, you know, a, a assistant principal once described me as an authoritarian teacher and did not mean it as a compliment, you know, you could argue that they take the behaviorism a little bit too far. What you cannot miss unless you want to miss it, frankly, is the deep investment that the, 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 the teachers have. Um, so you don't have to necessarily love their educational program, sure. um, but if you don't see the, 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 the deep engagement and ambition that the teachers have for their students, well, then, then you're either hard-hearted or you don't want to see it. And, and that's part of the culture, too. Um, I describe this in, in one chapter where, I, you know, explaining it to myself, I call it the GAS factor, which, uh, if I can say, is an acronym, and the GAS stands for give a shit yeah. um, you know and if you think about that this is this is what I think makes these schools most valuable even though they may do some things that you know you, you might not like think of how rare this is to be in a community like the South Bronx any you know inner city community in, in, in a large urban city if you are a, a low-income kid of color what reason do you have to expect your your relationship with a school or your parents relationship with the school to be anything other than dismissive or, or you know or, or coercive that's where you go to find out how little is expected of you right. by contrast at success academy nobody's telling you that this is easy um, you know meaning uh, the, the standardized tests that they, they they valorize so much they're telling you it's hard but they prepare you with attack uh, strategies and 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 practice tests and whatnot and they are you know during test season you're getting calls home from from your teacher every night you know to, to review the test with your parents and whatnot right. and and you're told hey kid you're gonna get a three you're gonna get a four meaning you know on or above grade level and then you go out and you get that three or your four but that's not even the most significant part all your friends do as well. All their friends do. Right. Every adult in your life is in on this. Right. The water and, you're swimming in. And you go home thinking, hey, I'm good at this. Right. I'm good at school. So in a way, to me, that even transcends, uh, that, that, I think that culture is more remarkable than even those remarkable test scores. Yeah. Just who else does this? This is the, the ultimately the most important value, I think, that emerges from this is you're raising a generation of kids who are just having a fundamentally different relationship with a place called a school. Yeah, the, the whole discussion around the selection mechanism at work, and I'm trying yeah. to put that in antiseptic terms. There is a selection yeah. mechanism, however it works. Um, it's just a non-starter for a lot of folks because they say, sure. no, the purpose of the school is to raise all boats perfectly and we're going we're gonna to do it for every kid. And what you're saying sounds like something that is mutually exclusive with that contention. Can we make a system that um, can deliver high results for everybody when we may not have the buy-in that we need at home? And I, I, I wonder if this is yeah. uh, uh, well, this you know, is part a challenge of to that. This Police. is this is part of the reason why uh, the, the, I think the book is a bit of a Rorschach test, and I'm trying to challenge people's priors here. Look, that's a lovely aspiration. We we should never give up on the idea that we can create a system of schools, an ecosystem of schools, uh, that challenges and raises the performance of of, of every child, or or sure. darn near every child. That is that is a that is the right goal. Um, but one of the reasons uh, that the, the, this book is called "How the Other Half Learns." It's because I don't think I'm wrong about this, Ned. I feel like functionally we have set excellence and equity at war with each other uh, in, in our schools and in this country. If you are a well-off white guy like myself, um, nobody asks a question about when, when I decided to, to, to take my daughter out of the public school system, she didn't spend a day in public schools, if someone like me chooses a private school, chooses to move to the, the, the suburbs where your, your property taxes sure. or your de facto... Uh, school tuition, that's not only unremarkable, it's uncontroversial. You know, nobody questions my ability to do this. Now along comes an Eva Moskowitz and figures out a way to give low-income people of color something similar, and now it's a problem. That's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. So, so what does that say? Um, I get to pursue excellence, but, but if you are low-income, black or brown, well, you get equity, and you get hand-wringing, and you get excuses. So those aspirations are lovely. But, but if you're, I don't think it's persuasive to a parent today to say, we're working on it, or at least there, there's got to be 
a statute of limitations when you can no longer say, give us time, we're working on it. Sure, when you come at this from a system level, it's, uh, it's affected by this thing you call in here the parent lottery, yeah. right? You can win the lottery for the school, but to actually make that stick, you might need the parent lottery. You might need parents that are willing to, to pull you through. Now, okay, but can I interject you here? You can. Because this is another unlovely thing that we do in this work. So I, I encountered these attitudes so often in the reporting of this book. So I described earlier um, the winners of that parent lottery and how this system through you know, uh, design or happenstance tends to favor parents disproportionately who are married, engaged, etc. Well, when you describe those families to people in our work, you know, you, you hear, well, I'm not worried about them. They'll be fine. Well, who says that to me? Who says that to you? You know, why do we think it's okay to say that or make those assumptions about low-income people of color? That if you've won the parent lottery, that's all you need. Because that's not all that, the, that, that my kid needs. It's not all that, that, that other people's kids need. And it's not all they're afforded. Well, that's exactly right. right. So there's this kind of, there, there, there's you know, two sets of kind of assumptions we make about inner city, and I speak as, as, as somebody who's been a teacher and a policy person. Um, need, they're, they're both rather um, unlovely. One is this attitude I just described where, oh, if, you've, if you have um, you know, a, a, um, a, a, a functional family, you're, you're growing up in a two-parent household, parents employed, you'll be fine. Um, the other one is, is even more pernicious and worse, which is, coming into uh, an urban community saying, and seeing nothing but dysfunction. Oh, I can't make demands of parents. I can't engage them because right. um, everything's broken, dysfunctional, et cetera. You're, all these children are traumatized. Right. Say what you will about Eva Moskowitz. You cannot accuse her of having low expectations of parents. That's right. There's a certain minimum level of respect that she has that is not That is structural the board. That, and, yeah. and, and, and frankly laudable. Now, uh, the flip side of this is okay, when I'm thinking from a system perspective, yeah. what does Success Academy do to the degree that it siphons off these kids who are parent lottery winners okay. from the schools? Because well, part of the, part, it is complicated because part of the uh, uh, assertion is that success is able to operate at this high level in part because they have that support at home. And if we are siphoning off that support, doesn't that make some schools jobs harder? Yes, it does. Did I just commit heresy? I was expecting a more complicated answer than <laughs> well, yes, well, no, it does. But this is this gets back to why I, you know, uh, questioning people's priors and why I wrote that kind of puckish piece about here's my new book. I sure. hope you hate it because that's the thing we're not supposed to say. And frankly, it's the thing that most of us in this work on the reform side probably don't believe. Uh, you know, we 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 have this idea that uh, you know we, we can create the rising tide that lifts all boats, and I'm not dismissive of that. I mean, I, certainly competitive factors. Sure make some sense. Um, but when I put on my you know, former teacher hat, when I think about uh, there were no success academies or even charter schools in the South Bronx when I was teaching there 10 or 15 years ago. But if I think about the families and the kids in my former classes who would be most likely uh, to be drawn off to a, a charter school, to a success academy, and now I imagine my classes without those kids there, uh, and now you're going to tell me, oh, no, I just made your job easier. Right. Well, that can't be right. Sure. If, if, if that's what research is telling us at the risk of offending uh, you know, my, my PhD research colleague here, uh, well, then we're asking the wrong questions. Yeah. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't account for culture. It doesn't account for motivation. Uh, maybe, you can, maybe there's some competitive effects there at work, but it's, it, it's, I think we have to be honest about that. I, you and, know, it rings true. I, my years of teaching. I had some kids that, you know, there's a spectrum of family involvement. Yeah. And I really appreciated those kids' presence you in my classroom. You sure do. <laughs> and now imagine that those kids go from being the culture outliers to the culture keepers. Again, that's not to say that it's going to be easy right. in one place and hard, but it's easier. You can get more done. Look, at the end of the day, that's that to me is the real lesson of Success Academy. It shows you the upward or the upper limits of what can be achieved when every adult in a child's life is is singing from the same hymnal, so to speak, pulling on, on, on the oars. Parents Parents, teachers, sure. administrators, etc. Let's let's talk about one last thing about sure. that hymnal. A lot of the notes in it are dictated from standardized tests. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. This place yeah. is driven by standardized tests, and they ring the bell. Yeah, I mean, they ring the bell. There's no doubt about it. They do it consistently, and and sort of your other work and writing, yeah. you've been a little critical about uh, test-driven accountability and the effects that yeah. it can have on schools, on the narrowing of the curriculum. Um, Two-part question. How 
does the 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 test driver manifest mm-hmm. itself in success academies uh culture and operations yeah. and you know handicap when it's a good thing and when it's not yeah boy we could we could talk for an hour on just that question i mean i, I you know I always say this, I've got a very complicated relationship with standardized testing. Nobody should sentimentalize the days before we had testing. Um, And in the main, the accountability impulse is a good thing. That said, I refuse to be uh, blind to the deleterious aspects of this, Uh, the the queering effect it has on school culture, uh, and and some specific granular damages that it does in reading uh, comprehension instruction, for example, curriculum narrowing, for example, where the the child's entire schooling becomes about reading and math and and nothing else. I think those are real measurable effects. Um, Well, those are the very topics that I'm curious about. How much of that evidence do you see? In other words, is well, success predicated on that narrowing, sure. or is it is it more well, than that? Okay, no. Uh, let, let me let me walk that back. They, they they are not narrowing the curriculum. It's interesting because at the end of the day, um, I, I think I even asked myself this in the book. I, I started worrying that I was falling victim to to Success Academy Stockholm syndrome by by dint of the fact that I was there so much because they do you know a lot of things that I don't necessarily like, but I, I liked what I was seeing in in the main and and as a whole. Um, And part of it is the culture, it's the motivation. Testing is a defining principle. It it focuses their their efforts and and it creates this metric of success that I think is more valuable than just the test score, this idea that I'm I'm, I'm good at school and so are all my friends. Um, But it is, what what is unknown and unknowable is the long-term effects on this. I mean, there's a, as I'm sure you know, a battle raging in our world about uh, whether testing uh, and, and a good good outcome on a sixth grade ELA test predicts long-term life success a- attainment, et cetera. Um, I think the jury's very much out on that. Uh, I'm persuaded, I've persuaded myself that getting the child's relationship and a functional and successful relationship with school is, is important. Um, one of the other hats that I wear is in, in civic education, and I tend to view schools as civic, uh, civic institutions first and foremost. And to me, having a child, having a productive relationship with the school as the civic institution of first resort, I think is important, and I don't want to d- diminish that. That's not the same thing as because I'm getting a level four in my ELA and math test, I'm definitely going to college, I'm definitely going to be upwardly mobile, it'll be a long time before we, 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 we know that. But your larger point is exactly right. Uh, it would be dishonest to say that these schools are not very, very focused on, on test prep and those metrics. But let's also be honest, this is a condition we've imposed not on just Success Academy, but on schools at large. Sure. So it's, it seems unusual um, to blame an Eva Moskowitz or someone like that right. to be really good uh, or blame them for being really good at playing this game that we've demanded that they play. That's right. An institution shaped by its competitive environment succeeds and then we fault it for it. That may not be a fair uh, progression. <laughs> yeah. uh, if, look, for what it's worth, I think she's actually, she didn't need uh, outsiders to persuade her of the efficacy of standardized testing. I think she's very much a, a true believer. But I, I, I've also been around her and her, around her schools enough to know that whatever the metric would be that we would design, she would figure out a way to, to, to crush it. So uh, last question, uh, short one. The the book is, uh, it, it's, it, it's solid and it's reporting. It is just a Thank solid you. piece of reporting Appreciate that is that. interesting. It is not, uh, it's just got a, a wide range of experiences, uh, emotions to share about it, uh, that, that you share in it. Um, but the test scores, let's move away from the test scores and just writ large, when you come to a school and evaluate, especially having spent this much time in it, Mm -hmm. is this a good school or not? Yeah, From a, you know that's my real question, right? Like, forget the test scores. It, you know, if they're scoring yeah. well on test scores, that that is a a narrow indicator. But our success academies, good schools. Yeah, it's it it, it is the only question that matters, right? And and it's interesting because I get asked this question a lot, and usually in the context of it being a gotcha question. You know, people who don't like these schools think that they're challenging me by saying, "Well, Pandisia, would you send your child to Success Academy?" And my honest and earnest answer reply is, well, what's what are my choices? And this gets to the heart of why you write a book like this. So, you know, would I choose Bronx One over my daughter's Upper East Side Manhattan school? No, I would not, and neither would you. Uh, would I choose it over the public school a few blocks away where I work for five years? Yes, I would, and so would you. 
If I were a parent uh, in New York City and I had a choice between uh, any charter school, would Success Academy be the, the first one I, I chose? Yeah, probably. I, I, I think so. And I, I say that even though I work in a competing charter school. Sure. I, you know, I, I still think it's, it's a culture, but that's my choice. Um, I kind of like rules and, and, and whatnot. That's, that's my orientation as a parent. That's sure. my orientation as a teacher. Um, does that make it right for every parent? No, it, it, it doesn't. Um, and and I, I, if nothing else, I hope we can get past this idea that there is a right way, that there is a true and only way to educate not just our own children, but especially other people's children. Sure. Yeah, different people see different things and they make uh, different conclusions. It's sort of like a Rorschach test, right? Hmm. Sounds like a good idea for a book. <laughs> I, I appreciate you coming by to talk about it and Thanks, uh, I appreciate the work, Robert. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. That's the end of our discussion with Robert Fendicio. Thanks for watching. As always, let us know what other topics you'd like AI scholars to cover on Viewpoint. And to learn more about Success Academy, check the links in the description below.